Uh, good morning everyone, um, welcome to IDS um, and particularly welcome to the participants of our short course on engaging evidence and policy uh, for social change. Um, so this is um, actually, uh, my name is James Georgiakis, I'm the Director of Communications and Impact here at the Institute. Um, so this event is actually the first in a new series that um, is going to be provided by the Institute. Uh, the Evidence into Policy and Practice series. Um, and uh, part of this series, there'll be events like this, live streamed, uh, physical events at the Institute, but there's also going to be uh, webinars, um, other kinds of online event, publications and reports, uh, book reviews, all kinds of things that relate to different aspects of getting evidence into use. Um, and some of the big themes that we're going to tackle are going to be around uh, theories and frameworks for evidence use and knowledge use. Uh, which is uh, something that Paul is going to be speaking to us about today. Um, how you frame evidence for policy and different approaches to evaluating evidence use. Um, so I'm really pleased that we can launch, to launch the series um, with, with this uh, focus on the politics of evidence. Um, uh, before I introduce uh, Paul properly, I just wanted to say that um, on the short course that I've just mentioned, we've just spent the last couple of days thinking about um, different aspects of how evidence and policy and practice uh, are, what the relationship is between those. Um, and we've been looking at different concepts of what we mean by evidence, um, different concepts of what we mean by the use of evidence, um, and also we've been thinking about, well, why does evidence matter? What is the impact? What is the outcome that we're look looking for that we think evidence can contribute to? And these are all actually quite contested areas. Uh, depending on your point of view. But I think the thing we felt we've so far slightly skirted around is the, how policy process and uh, politicians relate to all of this. And this is a pretty grim time for politics. It has to be said, it uh, seems almost, it's either really appropriate we're having this discussion today uh, or it's uh, really unfortunate, I'm not sure which. Um, because at the moment, in the UK or in the USA, we have a political system where it seems broken and it seems that the political institutions and the politicians are unable to give anybody what they want. Um, and I think in development studies in particular, this kind of sense of fear and disillusion and frustration with the elected officials can lead to us, in my opinion, withdrawing into a kind of safety net of research uh, methods and concerns around different ways of constructing knowledge and, and, and a sense that we need to be, uh, we're rather critical and dismissive of the elected politicians and of the political institutions um, and we don't have much time for trying to understand them and that certainly feels the case at the moment. Um, but I think one of the reasons I really wanted to invite Paul here is because his work has tried to inject some policy theory and political reality back into what we're all trying to do, which is forge a closer connection between evidence and policy and practice in order to promote uh, social and economic, positive social and economic change. So um, Paul is a professor of politics and public policy at the University of Stirling, uh, and he's been, he's well known for working on comparative public policy, and his research has spanned uh, comparisons of policy theories, methods associated with key theories and international policy processes, uh, including work on things like the global, to global tobacco control. Um, perhaps most relevant for today is the fact that he's begun to really produce some interesting work on how evidence, what, what role evidence plays in policy and policy making. And his book, The Politics, I'm going to promote this for you now, Paul. The book, The Politics of Evidence-Based Policymaking, I can highly recommend. It's been a big inspiration to me and to many others at IDS when we start to think about some of these complexities. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Paul now, and he's going to introduce us to his ideas. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, oh, right. Uh, oh, yeah, we've got a clicker as well. You want to use the... Uh, okay, right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, 
to go with the... Oh, okay, I'm quite unconscious. So I'll start, start again. <laughs> You're welcome to wander around on the side. Right, okay, yeah. okay. Um, so if you, th th if you think of the, the title of the talk, it, it, you know, subtitle is How to Maximize the Use of Evidence in Policy and Policy Making. So I think when I give this kind of talk, um, it, the, the title sounds like this is, this is quite a straightforward process. I'll give you five tips, and it's a bit like you know, self-help. You know, you can really make a difference here. But I want to give, can I give a context about you know, comparable sentences, how to maximize the use of something to give you a sense of... of um, now, I didn't really think about this very much. Okay, so please bear with me. Uh, the first one is, so how to maximize your chances of running faster than Usain Bolt? Now, that's, uh, you can imagine, I could give you some tips, you know, keep your knees up. <laughs> we're, we're the right trainers, that sort of thing. You know, these are good, sensible tips. We'll run faster. But, uh, you know, it, it's, you're, you're never really, as far as I can tell, you're never really going to uh, hit these heights. You know, that's, I think that's the one comparison. Or if you prefer, uh, you know, how to win a set against Serena Williams. And again, I don't even know. Uh, follow through. <laughs> follow through right? So, you, know, you can imagine, you know, give me some tips. You know, but it's in that context, isn't it? It's not, you can't take these tips and then suddenly go off and change the world on your own. Okay, I hope that's not too much of a controversial statement. <laughs> I know we're all supposed to change the world individually, but, uh, you know, there's too many of uh, us. So, uh, so, five tips in that context. Now, when we talk about maximizing the use of evidence, the first step is to decide what evidence is, uh, what counts, and, and what does evidence informed mean. Okay, now that... Um, it sounds so simple, isn't it? Uh, but so I've been in I've been in meetings where maybe there have been fifty of us in a room. You get these big interdisciplinary uh, world cafe type meetings, and it's right. Okay, first thing we'll do is we'll sort out what evidence means, we'll define it, and operationalise it, and that sort of thing. And by the end of the day, we've actually just made it more complicated. But <coughs> all we do in these meetings is uh, produce more questions. So start off at the day, what is evidence? And at the end is 10 questions. I don't actually answer anything. You know, so I think that's partly a problem. Now I think uh, one way to, to um, answer this question is in a very narrow way. So for example, um, you know, the caricature of you know, things like evidence-based medicine or some, some types of approach is that you decide what evidence counts with a hierarchy of research methods. At the top is randomized controlled trials and their systematic review. And then somewhere uh, down below, here, I don't know how far it goes, but that's expertise, you know, scientific expertise. And then somewhere towards my shoe is, you know, practitioner experience and several shoes of feedback and that sort of thing. That's one way to say this is evidence. Uh, but as I'll talk about later, you know, some people would, re would reverse that hierarchy and say right at the top is about, uh, you know, trial and error and uh, you know, practitioner experience on the ground, that sort of thing. So without deciding what evidence is it's difficult to know how you would talk about how to maximise its use, and I think I think that's probably you know politics in a nutshell. It's a competition to define what these things are and what they mean, and therefore you know what evidence informed means. So I didn't say evidence based just to save time. No, I could do a lecture for an hour on the problem of the phrase evidence based, right? But I don't think you want that, do you? So I just say you know we, people at the end of it, people say evidence informed just to sort of you know just imagine like a really tense one hour meeting. So, okay, right. Evidence informed, you know, fine. You know, just just to get out the door. But actually, evidence informed doesn't actually help you that much more than, than evidence based. But let's say we have decided decide what evidence counts. Then the second thing is respond to policymaker psychology. Now, I've I've done I've done that, a few of these talks through trial and error, and I used to put up um, uh, the the two shortcuts to bear in mind are rational and irrational. And it just, I think as soon as you say those words, I've actually, I've done it, I've done it, you know, you're thinking, okay, well, that's, those are very problematic terms. Now, what I would do is use them for, to sort of, not, not this audience, okay, you're all the exceptions, but to stick it to certain audiences uh, that, that essentially, they, you, I say to them, you know, you think that you're the rational research people with the objective opinions, and you think that pol policy makers, politicians are irrational and they're too emotional or too, you know, making too many choices based on, and anger, and I think uh, you know, you would say, okay, well, you know, humans are really some combination of those things. We combine cognition and emotion to make choice. So, 
uh, to, you know, to maximize the use of evidence, you would talk about uh, respond to this kind of human psychology and the way we communicate with people. So uh, some of that is quite simple. I think it's quite established in you know, kind of science communication. But a lot of this is about two, two connected things. <coughs> reduce, reduce uncertainty by producing more knowledge, uh, but also reduce the cognitive load of the information you provide. So, you know, be concise. So, you know, it's the usual joke is, you know, about some scientists says if they think they weren't successful with their 500-page report, the solution is a thousand pages. You know, obviously not much, not enough weight. Uh, when actually, you know, really, the, it's a, I guess it's a bit like uh, te technology. You know, we're you're, we're going smaller. You know, be more concise, communicate in smaller packages. Now, I think that's a kind of straightforward thing. That you don't actually need me for that. You know, you probably have already received. As for an academic in particular, you've probably received a bunch of. Uh, advice and you know be short, less jargon. You know, not don't 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 feel uh, married to eight thousand words. You know, so. um, but really in politics, the biggest competition is to reduce ambiguity rather than uncertainty. Now, ambiguity is the possibility to interpret the world or particular issues in many different ways, and people compete to define the same issue in a different way. So the classic one for me uh, would be. How do, you, how do you define tobacco as an issue? Now, the, the kind of long-term trend is to, is to compete to define it as a, a glamorous legal product that produces all sorts of economic benefits versus the biggest contributor to preventable non-communicable diseases and an epidemic of global proportions. And, and that's the competition that matters because the, the choice you make on, on uh, defining it in one way, to frame it or uh, understand it in one way, determines the demand for evidence. If you think it's an economic benefit, and it's really not a problem because people are free to do what you want, the demand for evidence is what, what, what in particular, how do you maximize the revenue? If you see it as a, an epidemic to be eradicated, like infectious disease, then you ask what is the evidence, what are the most effective policy instruments to reduce smoking in the population? And it's, it's the, the, the framing, it's the, it's the exercise of power to reduce ambiguity that determines that demand for information. So you won't do that just by shortening research reports. You do that by framing and telling stories to persuade people to understand the world in a particular way. Now that's, I think that's uh, what, number two. That, I think, how long did that take me to explain? Maybe about two or three minutes. Well, it feels like a two or three minutes to me. Uh, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? But how do you do that in practice? As, I'll go back to you saying, well, you know, you, you, how do you become this expert storyteller, persuading people to change the way they see the world? Uh, I don't know the answer. I shouldn't have asked that. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, I'm just asking questions. So, number three is uh, reject simple models of policy making. Now, uh, again, I've recorded a quite a few talks. I did a trip to the Antipodes and I, I recorded that. If you want, there's 12 hours of me talking about the simplicity of images out there. Okay. But in a nutshell, I don't actually have a simple image. I, I'm, I'm trying to manipulate you here. Uh, what I didn't put up is the simplest image of policy making is the policy cycle. Uh, I don't know. If it's, it's actually in, in there somewhere. Um, now, You've probably seen, it's a bit like this, only there are arrows, and it suggests that you can break down the policy process into a cycle in which you, for example, uh, identify a problem, identify a range of possible solutions, choose a solution, uh, legitimize it, assign resources to it, implement and evaluate. Nice simple policy making cycle. Um, now, in a nutshell, I think almost all kind of political science studies use that in a sense, well, most of them, uh, me, use that to insult the policy cycle at the start. Okay, so there are still some textbooks that use it and say it's useful as a US that sort of thing. But I just um, use it to, you know, to big up something else. Uh, now, the interesting thing is it's very useful for governments. I don't know why I'm pointing to it, but it's not there. <laughs> uh, so the cycle is not there. It's useful for governments because they can project what they're doing. They say, you, you elect us, we're in control at the center of government, and we will produce policy through this cycle. So it's all very democratic and, and simple. And actually, the, the, the body that, was, that, that held out the longest with this cycle image is the European Commission. You know, because you can imagine 
The context for them is many of their institutions are not elected, so they're looking to legitimise what they do in different ways. One of them is through the use of evidence, and one is through the use of a very um, clear policy cycle where you know who's in charge and what stages are. So the interesting thing for me is, I don't go off piece too much, is if you look at this, this is now what many people in the European Commission give you in their presentations. So the cycle is in there, but they're now presenting this big kind of spaghetti mess to say this is the European or any, this is the policy process. Now I think that's really significant, for me at least, in that you have a major international organisation saying, here's our policy process, uh, look at it, it's a big mess. You know, so it's, uh, I don't know, you can try, you can follow the arrows, the squiggles, but I don't think they're designed to tell you, you, you couldn't use that as a map to work out who to speak to and when. Okay, they're just trying to project. The word is very complicated and, you know, a cycle doesn't sum it up. So, uh, part of the reason I think why the cycle image still sticks is because it's simple, you can pick it up and use it quite quickly. It's quite comforting. So there's a psychology to these images, I think. That means you think, okay, well that's, uh, you know, a nice simple diagram makes you think, okay, the world is more, is not, it is complicated. So that's why I've produced my competing image uh, which I'm, I'm trying to compete on soothing, soothingness. So it's blue, I think soothing blue, and uh, there, there are a few words, and it's sort of, I've got a few versions of this, I've got one, someone told me this looked a bit like a turtle, do you think? <laughs> like, you know, like a, uh, on its back, okay, I don't know, that's not soothing, is it? That's going to raise anxiety, but... Uh, but um, so in, in the middle you've got what I talked about, psychology of choice, Surrounded by the thing that I'll talk about most, uh, which is the policy making environment, which we sometimes talk about an environment or a system or a complex system. And you can break it down into uh, these types of concepts. So, there are many actors operating across many levels and types of government. And so, uh, I've actually, I uh, should have gone to punt this a little bit, I've got it coming out, and so on. Um, multi centric. Policy making, we call it. Okay, so instead of there being one single central government, you have to account for many different centres, polycentric governments or, or uh, complex systems. Many actors are operating across many different centres. Each of those centres has its own institutions. An institution doesn't mean institution anymore, it means, um, you know, because institution used to mean, like, build, you could point to things, uh, your buildings and, you know, Westminster's institution, you know, parties. Now it essentially means a set of uh, rules and norms, and they can be formal and written down and well understood, like a constitution, but most of the interesting institutions are informal, unwritten rules that are they're often communicated non-verbally. And we'll come back to that a few times. When I, when I do this with students, I ask them what are the rules of the university, and they don't, they don't answer me, of course, and then I say to them, uh, okay, so the biggest rule for students, especially undergraduates, is you never answer a question in a lecture. Okay. Uh, people don't get together outside of the room and, and say to each other, you know, remember the code, you must never answer, all when you ask is a question. But people know it, they communicate it non verbally. I don't know, you know, through, that's how you communicate it. Uh, right, so that's an institution, just, just like a constitution. Uh, we'll come back to that. And then we say networks, really, most policy is processed at a low level of government, well away from the centre. Uh, uh, through uh, people like civil servants who are, uh, well, at least in the UK, are, are generalists and who rely on lots of other bodies who are specialists. They form relationships and, and process policy that way. And then we talk about ideas, which are you know, collections of fundamental beliefs about the world, which inform our interpretation of more uh, you know, mobile... Pol you know, we talk about policy ideas, which is, you know, have an idea like a policy solution. And they're interpreted through the, the, the lens of people's deeply held beliefs. So when we talk about ideas, it's those two processes coming together. A great solution for one audience is a terrible solution for others, because they have these fundamental beliefs. And then we talk about context and events. So events can be routine, like elections, non-routine, like uh, in, you know, environmental crises. Oh, that, I guess that's, they are routine, but you know, you get the idea. Uh, and, um, uh, you talk about socio-economic context. Uh, so with the example of tobacco again, the three things I would pay attention to are how many people smoke and how often, what are their attitudes to tobacco control, and how much uh, taxation does smoking raise within a population. 
So when you look at the UK story, why has tobacco changed over the long periods? Well, one of the factors is fewer people smoke, they're less <coughs> opposed to tobacco control, and the, there's a combination of it provides less money to the Exchequer, and the Treasury took a decision not to value that money. Okay, so my favourite, I, I, I didn't memorise, my favourite quotation is of a health minister in the UK in the 50s who said pretty much, uh, the only reason we can fund our health services is because so many people smoke. The, the <laughs> revenue is 15% of all our income pays for the hospitals. Yeah, you know, why would we ask people to stop smoking? What would we do? <laughs> okay, I can get into that. There's a long sort of inappropriate jokes about that. Well, I'll leave it there. Uh, so now they don't. Now the Treasury made a decision that, uh, that um, they, uh, in the mid 2000s they took responsibility for health inequalities. And then, of course, as soon as they did that, they know. Uh, smoking is one of the biggest sources of health inequalities. Uh, so, the, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a combination of a political choice and a socioeconomic context. Those kind of things explain, those are, that's the policy making environment. You get a handle on, on those kind of factors, then you know how people operate within a political system. Now, again, that sounds, that's a bit more complicated, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, kind of wrapped through that, but I smiled when I explained it, so it seems quite simple. But that's, that's kind of summed up 50 years of writing by. Thousands of academics. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's only it's a story, isn't it? It's a simple story, but it really, I think what you'd remember is oh, it's a really complicated field. Okay, okay number four. Uh, think about what good policy making is. Now, I like this, it's on my to do list, a nice paper on what's good policy making. But um, you would say often people uh, equate good policy making with evidence based policy making. Uh, but there are many models of good governance, which I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, uh, so they could be, you know, they could be deliberative, they could be participatory, they can be localist rather than centralist. And as soon as you make those other choices, it presents you with all sorts of dilemmas about uh, how you should treat evidence <coughs> in a more, in a wider sense within a political system. And that's particularly true if you come back to the what is evidence question, which I'll try and. Uh, uh, I tried to simplify that this is when I'm trying to keep you in a good mood so I can give you the this table, okay, which takes a bit more engagement with. But too many words, isn't it? There's a, kind of, there's a point in which you've got too many words. But essentially this is what happens if you combine the what is evidence question with the what is good governance question. You can have I present to you three three different models. One is one you're probably quite familiar with, which is, um, I've called it implementation science, but uh, it's essentially uh, the, the answer to the what is good evidence question is a hierarchy of knowledge, experimental design, mostly RCTs. Uh, then you say, well, how should you scale up? We often talk about scaling up best practice, you know, going from success in one area to success in many areas. Well, you, you have to uh, have a uniform model and, and fidelity to that model. And you, you, your priority is the active ingredient of the model. There's a, there's a particular cause in this model that you have to spread. A bit like there's a causal, I, at one point I knew this, there's a causal ingredient in ibuprofen. I forget what it is. I don't know, anyone? I've got it written down. If you want to know, it, that would really bother me now. I'd have to Google what's the yeah, ibuprofen. But you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like a, 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 like a what's the active ingredient of medicine? Uh, we, we've tested it in, in controlled trials, so we have to roll out the medicine. Okay, so the, an, an, uh, an alternative is more of a storytelling approach, which you say, okay, we'll place much more value on practitioner experience, services of feedback, and conversations between those kinds of people. So the way you scale up is you tell stories to each other, and, and you try and work out if you share a similar context and experience. If you do, you can start to learn and, and adopt policies from other people. And your, your priority is governance principles like uh, respect for localism, uh, deliberation, uh, respect for service users. You know, so that, for example, a lot of that is developed in, in things like care home settings where they talk about, um, oh, the phrase is gone, but, uh, um, oh, oh, okay. Uh, okay, that's a cliffhanger. But they, they talk about, you know, things <laughs> like uh, um, homely settings and, you know, the, the main idea is respect for people who, who live in care homes. Uh, and then the third one is uh, either the best or worst of both worlds, depending on your particular view here. Uh, these things are remarkably political. It looks so uh, mundane, doesn't it? But this is where all the, the big debates take place between, between people. 
Um, so you take it, say, improvement method. Well, let's not be too narrow about evidence, but let's, let's gather uh, quite a range. And let's focus on experimenting. We'll train people in a particular method. PDSA, isn't it? Plan, do, see, act, is that? But yeah, okay. It's, it, in my mind, PDSA is the, there's a, there's a, there's a pet charity. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's not that. It's, it's plan, do, no, study. Plan, do, study, act. Okay, so experimentation. And essentially the watchword is, if what you're doing is working, keep doing it. And I think the sense is, don't worry too much about what's causing it to work. As long as it keeps working, that, that's, what you're, that's what you're focused on. And the emphasis is on things like training and, and feedback, where people come together and describe their experiences. Okay, so these are three kind of ideal types, or three models of the ways in which you can combine evidence and governance to make choices about what is kind of evidence-based policymaking and practice. And I think the point to remember is, uh, one and two are almost polar opposites. You know, you, uh, when I try, I, I try, I say, not many people care, but I try when I do this with government on I say, you can't really support both of these at the same time in the same project, can you? And, you see, and the usual response is, you know, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom or something like that, you know. Me you know methodological pluralism, and I find that very frustrating, but you know, you can see the real tensions here between the types of ways you use evidence and, and try and spread it out. And number five is decide how far you'll go. This is more the political side. You know, how far are you going to engage uh, energetically in a political process if you're focused on getting what you want? Okay. Uh, so there, that's a nice natural... In my mind, this is the whole thing was going to take 30 minutes. I think we're already up to, what's that, about 20, 20 something. Uh, so I'm just going to check the body language to see how much more you've got. <laughs> Very polite. Okay, so let me take a, take a sip and then. So essentially, this next part. The question is given if you accept all what I've told you so far, I'm going to say you've got some big choices to make if you really want to maximize the use of your evidence in a policy process. Okay. Now, this is the nice. Um, kind of bland set of advice, I reckon I could get a good training course out of this. You know, I could become a consultant and charge you a, th a thousand an hour for this bland advice uh, that really, if you, if, you, if you think about it, I'll distract you a lot so you don't think about it, but uh, this, is, this is what it would be. Okay, so you take the picture we've got, and we'll just talk about how you adapt to these environments. Well, Given that there are so many different centres and levels of government, find out where the action is, because there's no point in trying to lobby people who are really not particularly involved. Don't assume it's central government. Don't assume it's elected politicians. It's often <coughs> people spread across political systems who have a particular interest or energy to do something. Learn the rules. So I talked about uh, institutions as collections of rules. So if you're engaging with, with more than one venue, they'll have their own rules, and you have to learn what they are. Now, imagine... I don't know if you've gone to work at say, a new organisation, how long it takes you to learn the, the unwritten rules of the organisation. A long time, isn't it? You probably make, unless you're really, I think you could learn them very quickly if you were kind of uh, quite, uh, if you were sort of, what would be the word, kind of socially inept, you could learn them very quickly just by breaking all of them very, you know, on the first day or something like that. But yeah, I think most people, they try and feel their way through organisations. It might take a long time. Okay, so imagine if you're actually, you're not working there, you're just trying to engage to, to form relationships. It takes a long time. Uh, learn, the same thing with, you know, learn, if, if this is all about ideas, then learn the language. Language is a currency of discussion. So learn, uh, you know, the language that, that, that uh, uh, shows you people's deeply held beliefs. And often that is about picking up on the things that they take for granted. You don't meet people and they say, let me tell you, well, I mean, most people, some people will, okay. But most people don't say to you, okay, we've just met, let me tell you all my fundamental beliefs about the world. Uh, so that's going to take time. Uh, build trust and form alliances. So the ways in which, I think the common ways to build trust, uh, it, uh, I guess you might say there are three ways. There's always threes or fives. So three ways it would be you trust people with whom you have worked in the past and have proven to be reliable. You trust people if you share the same outlook in life, the same beliefs, or perhaps you trust people who have some kind of claim to authority. Okay, so I guess your, your way to build trust 
would be to prove reliable over the long period, provide information reliably <coughs> and quickly, uh, don't, you know, don't provide misleading evidence to get what you want short term if you're focused on the long term. So I think that's what, when people do these studies of policy communities, that's what the, the biggest piece of advice from that is <coughs> that successful groups do not complain in public if they didn't get what they want the first time because they'll be trusted much more over the long term if they, if they you know, um, you know, keep things in house. You know, they don't they don't uh, air their. <coughs> I, I was going to say dirty laundry. Is that still a phrase? That's, uh, that was a phrase when I was a child. The uh, dirty laundry. But um, so, and I, and I think that's that's not intuitive, is it? You would think. Uh, you know, a lot of groups are really about getting the most attention for issues and complaining that things aren't working out. I think a lot of this post community stuff is about forming trust by just accepting defeat. Uh, you know, for success in the long term. And exploit events and winds of opportunity, which I think winds of opportunity. That sounds so simple, doesn't it? Just wait for the right time. You'll, you have to, eventually, your opportunity will come. You just have to be ready for it. You know, if you look at the kind of policy studies literature, it essentially says you could wait 30 years for this opportunity, and it may not actually come, or it will come, and, and then you'll fail. That's a much. I wouldn't put that in my training course. <laughs> okay. I think that's the truth. You know, lots, lots of these case studies about these winds of opportunity never arose. Okay, now, number two, much more attractive, look at the production values here, uh, <laughs> is uh, teamwork and knowledge management organisations. So, this is something I, I can only take a, a small percentage of the credit here because it's being recorded, right? So, um, but essentially, <laughs> this is the Joint Research Committee of the European Commission. They did their kind of um, uh, literature review and they did lots of uh, world cafes and um, expert interviews and um, uh, you know, group discussions to say what are the skills that an organization would need to be in a, an effective at knowledge management for policy. And the interesting things in a nutshell would be there are eight of them. Only one of them mentions research, the Derby. And it's about synthesizing research. You know, I think academics in particular are used to, uh, particularly around this kind of time of the cycle, producing original narrow research. You know, the, the, the biggest, highest status, highest impact journals publish very narrow, sophisticated research that no one reads. Oh, okay, apart from, yeah, I mean, some people read, but they're not, they're not really written to be read, these things. Whereas... Policymakers are interested in synthesizing research across the board, okay, which is not particularly, unless you're really clever about it, it's not the thing that will make someone's career for being assessed for you know, high impact. So you imagine only one of them is research, and it's the type of research activity that is not really an incentive for many people, at least in academia, to do. Some of the others are about... Um, the way I paraphrase it and about giving advice to policymakers is some policymaking audiences will say to you, I'm not interested in you coming along and just saying, oh, I'll just give you the facts and I've no opinions about what you should do. You know, they want to speak to people who will make a case for a particular policy change in relation to evidence. And I think, again, that's a quite a hard sell for some, for some people. Okay, but you can imagine, you can, you can, an organisation can develop these skills in a few uh, training programmes. And again, that's a nice relatively safe process, uh, no, no, there's no real, they're hidden somewhere, but no real ethical challenges or, or too many problems in responding there. <laughs> and the third ones are, uh, I don't know if this translates, I don't know if you like Bosch, the kind of Bosch pictures, they're all these kind of <coughs> disturbing images, I don't know what, what, what it was up to, but uh, this one is handy in that, because I'm trying to give you a ladder of ethical dilemmas, the higher up you go, essentially the, the more challenging to your, um, your, your, to your kind of moral compass these things would be. You know, because you know, in politics you've got these choices about how far you would go. So I guess this is the idea: how far up this ladder into, which I'm guessing is someone's orifice. I don't know who this guy is, but it's, it's definitely his behind. So how far up the ladder uh, towards the business end of politics are you willing to go? I think that's the question. I can't, if I were going to publish this, I can't use that picture. Uh, any advice on the image? Very welcome. Okay, so 
The first one, the bottom rung in the ladder, I think, is tell effective stories. Now, I think actually for some, I spoke to scientific audiences, this is a bit of a push already. Because uh, there are some scientists who will say, well, I'm not a storyteller, I am a, an objective researcher. I don't tell you stories, I give you the facts. Um, I think if you're a bit more sensible, you say, well, really, a story is about presenting uh, a, a small amount of the most relevant information, focusing on the audience to have the greatest impact. Okay. And there are people like uh, Desiree Crow and Michael Jones that write about, you know, a narrative is a, is, has four parts. And if you can work out the, the narrative form, then you, uh, you can present, you know, particular ways to tell effective stories. I think what's it, you need a, there's a setting, so which is your possibly context. There is the, uh, there are characters, so you choose, do you want a hero or a villain or there are other characters. Then there's a plot, and I think they talk about there's only ever seven plots and stories, mm -hmm. and they're usually about, <coughs> I come along and tell you a story where I faced adversity and things were going badly for a while and then I succeeded at the end, that's a kind of common plot. Then there's a moral, which is what's the, do you want me to do the software changes just now? No. Uh, there's, a, there's a moral, which is what, what should policymakers do about it? Uh, now, uh, this is really excellent work, which is really worth reading. But my impression of what, what their punchline is, is um, these stories that you, you tell or people tell uh, do not compete well with the stories people tell themselves. Okay, so what they tend to find mm -hmm. is they've identified empirically the most effective stories, but the most impact is on telling people a story that they already believe to reinforce their energy towards doing something about it. It's not to change their minds. And I think that's an important point about storytelling. I, I, would, I wouldn't go into thinking this is about changing hearts and minds with stories. Almost all of their evidence is about you're reinforcing hearts and minds, which, which is not to be sniffed at. You know, I think the difference between, say, elections or the difference between someone doing something or not is the level of uh, emotional uh, or other engagement they have with an issue. It makes a difference between them having a a belief about something and actually trying to do something about it. And it can make a difference between them doing something about that belief and ignoring all the other beliefs that, if you think about it, will contradict that one. So it's not to be sniffed at. We're not changing minds. We're just, we're just reinforcing people's beliefs and giving them a reason to act. Okay. The second is to be entrepreneurial and exploit winds of opportunity. Uh, now, I guess we're running out of time. You, you can read up on this. I, I've become obsessed with what the, the metaphor is for wind of opportunity. So some people, you get into it, this is about three things coming together, and they're often called three streams. That's why it's called multiple streams. It's a problem stream, so for, for something to happen, people have to pay high attention to a particular problem. There has to be a technically and politically feasible solution to that problem already available. And policymakers have to have the motive and opportunity to select it. That's a window of opportunity that we're talking about. It can, ha it can happen tomorrow or it can happen in 20 years. Um, so some people use a kind of watery metaphor, but in a nutshell, I don't like the watery metaphor because you know, as soon as these streams in real life come together, they're inseparable, aren't they? It, there's an inevitability to what happens next. I think really what Kingdon is talking about is something like a space flight in which all these things have to come together at the same time for it to lift off. And if they don't, they will stop. I think that's what the window of opportunity is. You've got this bit, moment in time to do something, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't happen. Okay. So, okay. If we had more time, I would talk. That's my favorite part of this whole talk. <laughs> <laughs> the metaphor. There's actually a, kind of a real argument with senior scholars about this. Can you imagine? With all the things going on in the world, I think the most of oh, no, it's space, it's not water. Right, okay. So, the third one, we're going up a rung here. Uh, in a nutshell, now, the Advocacy Coalition contains a lot of things. But the basic story is, people go into politics to turn their beliefs into policy. They form coalitions with people who share their beliefs, and they compete with people who do not share their beliefs. So you imagine you've got politics as a competition between coalitions. So don't try and read the words. I've deliberately tried to obscure the words with these pictures. 
Because you know what, as soon as you put up a thing with words, people want to read it. They'd stop listening to me. And I, I can see it in the audience. And the people, and half the audience is not listening to me anymore. They're saying, what's that? Oh, policy of what? You know. So I'm trying to obscure it. Uh, I need to just give you this. Next time I'll do that, I'll just give you this. Uh, but, but what they say, so this is, they've got a, they've got a diagram you can look at. But um, the most interesting thing for us is that what they say is, for various reasons, coalitions tend to romanticize their own cause and demonize the cause of their opponents, and they act on that basis. So if you imagine if you're trying to maximize the use of evidence, I think what this suggests is uh, give evidence to your allies to give them the energy to do something about it. Don't waste your time giving evidence to your competitors because they will ignore it and question your, uh, your credentials. Okay, so this is not a process of spreading evidence across the political system so that everyone can benefit from it. It's a strategic use of in in information to give to some coalitions who share your beliefs so that they can win in arguments against people who don't share your beliefs. So, of course, we're up a ladder of moral dilemma here because to do that, you have to make a choice about what your political beliefs are uh, so that you can maximize the use of your time to energize people who, whose beliefs you share. Okay, and I think lots of people, I think, think, oh, I can be an, an objective research giver on all sides and the truth will out, you know. The evidence will win the day, and if it hasn't done in the short term, it's just because people haven't gotten enough. Now, really, I think this sort of suggests, uh, the thing suggests is, is give up on that idea that evidence wins the day. Choose your allies and your aims and focus your attention on that. Destroy your competition. <laughs> so, we've got, I think we've got two more, lad, two more rungs to go up. Uh, this one's quite similar, I think, which is uh, frame issues to either increase attention and participation or limit participation. So, in a nutshell, this type of theory about you know, so-called punctuated equilibrium, it uses a kind of earthquake analogy, which is um, most policy change is uh, minor, hyper-incremental, nothing happens, no one really pays attention and things just go on as they are. A tiny proportion of policy changes are dramatic, and there's uh, an unpredictable. You know, like earthquakes. You know, I guess it's uh, in, in most places across the globe there are there are none, and in some places there are some, and they have a profound impact. So that's the kind of image they're looking for. So, strangely, uh, this image gives you the opposite impression because you would think to yourself, this is the earthquake here, uh, but this is. This is the hyper-incremental change. This is, most policy change is, is in or around zero. Uh, and it's the tails that matter. It's, uh, there's a tiny number of huge changes in policy making. Now, the, if you're trying to extract strategy from that, you would say, okay, I think people's, uh, a lot of people's instinct is to say, uh, let's generate the maximum amount of attention for our cause, because we need that attention to make a difference. And that fits in with that window of opportunity type thing. But the alternative is to do the opposite, is to know that people will mostly, most people will, will ignore almost everything almost all the time. So exploit that. You know, what you want to do is to be in a room with almost no one else so that you can be the most influential person with policymakers. And you don't do that by raising attention to an issue. You do it by presenting it as technical and humdrum, only for the experts, you know, that sort of thing. Okay. So, of course, some might say, but that's completely anti-democratic. Uh, okay, uh, but I say to you, you know, are you interested in democracy or are you interested in getting what you want? Okay, <laughs> I can't can answer that question for you. Uh, what I can do is take us up a notch, which is uh, social construction and policy design literature. Now, this is by far the worst one. I think you can see it in my face. By the time I get to the stage, I've kind of slightly disgusted bringing it up, but this is, um, this, I think you would recognize this kind of element of politics where you've got politicians who, they, they come to very quick characterizations of target populations. Some populations are good people who deserve all the support from government. Some people are, are terrible who deserve all the government's punishments. And they do that in two different ways, depending on how you perceive people. One is they do that emotionally, they have 
you know, pride and disgust for people, and they've made this choice in their gut. Another is that they do it strategically by exploiting the social stereotypes that are in the population, and they use them for political gain. Now, we could get, we could get into their motivation, but the, 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 um, the upshot in both cases is that they've characterized populations really simply, they cherry-pick evidence to support those claims, and they reward some groups and they punish some groups. And that has a long-term effect on citizenship. The people who benefit from, from government action uh, feel enthused. They know there's a link between how they engage with policy and uh, what happens. The people who are um, uh, punished see no reason to engage in politics to become alienated. And so it really skews uh, democracy and it really uh, sticks it to some populations. Okay, now, what I would say to you is, if you're dealing with politicians who routinely do this, who have these, who, who are either emotionally connected to this idea that some, there are good and bad populations, or have made it their political strategy to demonize some politicians, uh, populations for political gain, and you're an advocate of a particular form of evidence, it stands to reason your most impact is by humoring their view of life and saying, here's the evidence to support it. And it stands to reason that if you go in with evidence that says, this evidence completely challenges the, your fundamental beliefs about life or your strategy, you will not have much success with those policy So your choice is to engage with what you... Assuming you don't agree, I, I suppose... It, I'm assuming you don't agree with these cherry-picking politicians. Assuming that's true, your choice is, should I challenge them with no effect, or should I humor them for maximum effect? Okay. I don't smile too much at that one, because that, this is a kind of awful choice, isn't it? These are, probably, these are the choices you face when you are, are dealing with real people who you're trying to describe evidence to. There's one part evidence and one part social skills and ethics. Okay, so then it takes me to my final, it's like kind of nice to be, if you go back to the slides, I don't, I don't know why you would, I do, because I like to read what I've said, but um, if you go back, maybe your question would be, why, why are you trying to maximise the use of evidence, you know, uh, and how far should you go? Now, if it's because you're a research purist and you're simply interested in hierarchies and that reflecting in politics, that's one thing. If you're interested in an outcome, in which you want evidence to produce uh, policy change and social change. And I would say that's one part evidence and 99 parts political strategy. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. That was uh, <coughs> very thought provoking. Uh, as advertised, um, and um, I think there's going to be lots of questions from the audience. Uh, <clears throat> two things that I really liked. I'm not a great fan of toolkits and top tips, although I think I might have been the author of a couple of them, <laughs> and I like the idea of providing a toolkit around policy engagements rather like uh, telling someone to buy a new pair of trainers so they can run like Usain Bolt. Um, and I think, I don't know, maybe you are the first person ever to put up a slide at IDS saying the words limit participation. <laughs> possibly, possibly. Um, but I, I actually think a lot of what we do, when we, talk, when we talk about things that we call policy engagement, we're talking about a group of specialists engaging with another group of specialists in a very closed policy space, working on quite incremental technical change that's evidence-informed, that never never leaks out into the wider uh, policy discourse. So I think quite a lot of that actually goes on. Um, so I'm going to take questions uh, for Paul. And maybe we've got a mix, real mixture of people here. So maybe you could just say your name and if you're not, whether you're from IDS or whether you're from somewhere else when you ask your question. And we'll have a mic that will come round. Take these two. I'll take three. Actually, so I'm going to take this yeah. Melissa first. Yeah. Then uh, who's, who's, we don't need a mic. We've got ceiling mics. You don't need a mic. <laughs> okay, so Melissa. So 
also, Paul, thank you. Melissa Leach, Director of IDS, and also someone who's engaged in and worked on these debates about the politics and the policy process for a very long time. Um, first of all, I really appreciate your interest in narratives, um, and really more a, a comment than a question. I think there's growing interest amongst scientists in thinking about the implicit narratives that are there in, in, in their work mm. and how those can be brought out. And some quite interesting debates in the UK, the Royal Society is kicking off some of this as well. My question though was about power, because for someone who's a professor of politics, mm. actually the word power was remarkably low key in what you presented to us, and particularly in that very nice little little framework which had the psychology of choice in the middle, which which I assume is kind of which, which you talked around. And it was quite interesting to me that power and politics don't figure in that diagram, and yet yeah. they're, they're presumably implicit in a lot of what you're saying. I wonder yeah. if you could just spell out for us a little bit more where to you power figures and what kinds of theories of power, I can realize this is a, a big question, yeah. um, do you see as relevant to the different bits of that diagram? How are you reflecting on yeah. that? Okay, so uh, actually, that, that's um, I meant to. Someone said this to me in the last talk I gave, and I meant to do something about it. I didn't, I didn't learn. I didn't learn. Uh, I did give an answer, which is yeah. So I, I suppose I, I, I suppose I don't use power uh, because I'm so used to teaching. Power and we start with uh, what does it mean? Uh, so hard to operationalize, and it's a bit like you know we start a, an MPP. What is policy and that sort of thing? And you know, and you, you don't really come up with an answer. So uh, the way I would normally teach it is to say you know, the classic power discussions were about reputational power based on uh, surveys. Who is powerful in this community? Then it was replaced by a kind of pluralist discussion about you know what what resources do people have and and how do they engage and who wins and who loses and you, 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 you find out who's powerful by um, who wins. Um, now, okay, so then that discussion pops up in networks because a lot of pluralists talk about no, no single body is powerful across a system, they're just powerful along in different, in different networks. Okay, um, then you would move on to, you know, that kind of... Um, <coughs> Power as uh, knowledge and beliefs, and about uh, you know the, the most uh, the, 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 the most effective way to be powerful is to manipulate people's beliefs or reinforce their beliefs, so that they, they, they you're essentially being powerful by encouraging people to do what they already wanted to do. That you know that sort of thing. So that comes up in in ideas, for example, or uh, really you know power is exercised through. The standard operating procedures that, that are in government that benefit some people routinely and punish some people routinely, and they, so that's in institutions. Yeah, so it, it is there, um, and it, it's in. It was in that discussion of uh, you know ambiguity because that was the power to decide what the world is, and therefore how or what policy problems are and how we should deal with them. Okay, so okay, ne next time I need to make a, a mental note. And just say at the start, you know, look for power in, in these things. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we had some hands up earlier. I just want to, so Al, Al perhaps next. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, thanks. Uh, that was a uh, top presentation. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I'm Al Scott. Uh, I've worked in knowledge and uh, communications and advocacy for forever. I'm older than I look. Um, <laughs> and my background was in uh, NGO campaigning when I first started. And one of the dilemmas that you touched on is one that I'm and we are often wrestling with, I'm certainly wrestling with, your angels and demons mm. picture, the advocacy coalitions. And obviously, you know, you're, you're dead right. If you're uh, campaigning for uh, an NGO and you want to push a particular line, you work with the coalitions <coughs> that you're most likely to succeed with, who are the people who are most likely to share the, the beliefs that, that you're coming from. Mm. One of the issues, though, in the current global climate with politicians around the world, the Trump phenomenon, the Brexit, Brazil, everything else, where basically experts, there's no such thing as experts, uh, there's no such thing as evidence. All these people, particularly social scientists, are just lefty liberal globalists, and they're not producing evidence at all, they're just spouting their own personal mm -hmm. ideological opinions. That narrative is really big and powerful now, and it's very polarizing, we know that. I'm just wondering, is 
is there a danger of, by working so much with coalitions who already reflect your beliefs, mm. is there a danger of kind of inadvertently sort of undermining your own credibility in the long run yeah. by becoming too associated with those groups? I'm thinking particularly with the climate change debate where climate scientists have tons and tons of evidence about the problem in the atmosphere, but it's very easy for people now to dismiss them and say, no, 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 no they're, just, they're, just, they're just greeny lefties, it's nothing to do with the evidence at all. Is there any way to mitigate against that, or I, I don't know, is there any, do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, so, so it's one of the things I guess I reflect on, you know, so, um, so for example, uh, I mean this is a bit away from the issues you discussed, but I used to do research on the, well it seems like such a long time ago, the referendum on Scottish independence. And that, at the time that was the most uh, salient, intense competition before the, the Brexit one really uh, outdid itself. <laughs> you know, so um, <laughs> at, at the time I thought, what, what will people think of us? Turns out we were actually very civil. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> well, the Scottish reputation was really rocketed. Uh, so, um, uh, so one journalist said to me at one point, uh, we're struggling to get academics who we can present as academics. Because so many people have chosen sides. We can't just commission someone or can't quote, quote someone without essentially doing that kind of right of reply thing. So that is, a, that is something in the mind of, of, of people. Um, and, but the, I sp and, and I, so I tend to be careful and to just, I don't think you know what I think of anything. Because I'll, in fact, I'll, I'll lie to put people off, right? So, that, so I've made my choice, but, but that's a choice, I think, to be uninfluential. Uh, so other people have made a choice to be completely discredited by one group and to be idolized by another group. You know, so I think that's there's two sides of the same coin, isn't it? The you, you you're essentially trading two contradictory things where you accept you'll be challenged by one group of people uh, but uh, supported by another. And I and I, th I don't think there's, there's no real there's no I think there's no kind of magic solution to that. It's about a choice about uh, what you're comfortable with. Uh, uh, okay. Is that even, even if you don't make a choice, if someone disagrees with me on Twitter or something, they'll put professor. You know, they'll say, oh yeah, professor, yeah, yeah, you know what you're talking about. You know, so you, you get that. I think you get that anyway. You know, it's just easier and harder. Right, well, I'm going to take a, I, I'm going to take three now in one go, uh, so because I think we're going to run out of time otherwise. So there, one there. There was one right over here. Neil and uh, <coughs> this hands now and Hannah. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Nadeep. And um, my name is Alex Shankland. I'm a fellow here at IDS, and I work on, um, among other things, riotous ways of changing policy. Um, we call on really politics, popular protest, and the implications of that for decision making around things like food prices. So it'd be interesting to hear from you where that might mm. fit in. Um, but I also I also work in Brazil, which, as uh, Alice mentioned, is an interesting moment in terms of politics and policy. But actually, I'm glad the slide is up because here at IDS we love a good framework and we've perpetrated quite a few of them. <laughs> and one thing we do notice is that they all start off serene and blue and turtle shaped and they all mm. end up looking like the spaghetti junction on, on the left. So, um, but I wanted, of course, to, uh, to problematize the framework because that's what we do, that's our core business. Um, and point out that the, the harmony and symmetry and calmingness of it um, is... Um, in the current historical moment, as, as, as you know, we've all been thinking about, um, probably a little bit detrimental to its mm. uh, acceptability, because actually what we're talking about, and as I mentioned, is that the ideas blob, otherwise known yeah. as the ideology blob, is actually bigger. It's, 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 you know, it's crowding out the rest. Mm. So I was wondering, in terms of how you use this analytically, whether actually you've tried in different national contexts and different historical contexts in the same country, to look at how blobs grow and shrink. Yeah, we might look at Blair era government, where perhaps networks and institutions had a bigger, a bigger role because everything was technical and everything was depoliticised. We may look now at Bolsonaro's Brazil mm. or Brexit Britain and see the ideas blob growing. I'm just wondering if 
Perhaps, I mean, it's a fantastic presentation already, but if you use some of those groovy animation tools, you can make the blocks grow and shrink, and that might actually tell yeah. another story about how the policy landscape uh, shifts and how different elements become more or less important. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so just, yeah, uh, can I have your question as well? Yeah. Pilton, uh, also a Chinese fellow, and uh, working in the Center for Development Impact, Impact Innovation. Uh, but before that, I work as a policy advisor. Um, and my question comes a bit in the, that interlink. I, I like the narrative um, which you mm. present as a central focus. But I think your 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 a bit simplistic idea of that evidence is or to de de uh, demonize or to uh, romanticize narratives. So it's supporting or, or critiquing uh, other narratives is a bit simple because I think in um, in practice, there is a debate between narratives. There's a narrative, there's a counter narrative. Mm -hmm. There's a narrative, there's somebody who questions the narrative. And what evidence does, uh, in my experience, is to prepare the narrative for the critique of the other group. So you are implicitly, as a researcher, or as, a, as an impact evaluator, or as a, a focus officer, mm -hmm. you are working, anticipating the narrative of somebody else, <coughs> not your own narrative. And then I think it opens a bit more positive opportunities for evidence to be less uh, subjective than in your, your mm. okay. okay. So, one more? Just yeah. Quickly. So, it's not my question, it's um, from one of our online viewers, Ooh. Joshua. Um, from Nigeria, and I'll, I'll leave this open to your own open interpretation about how you interpret and answer the question, because it's quite a broad one. Um, what do you do when evidence-based policy making doesn't work? <laughs> right. Okay, so you've got, uh, does the ideology ideas bubble grow and shrink? And can you please animate your slides? <laughs> uh, counter narratives, and, and what we do when it doesn't work? Okay, uh, and we're... Oh, no, it's okay. we've, got, we've got some time. Got okay, some time. so, okay, um, I, I think the third question, I, I could speak more with the person in more detail, but the third question I think is easiest because essentially, you know, my um, offer is that evidence-based policymaking never works. You know, it, it doesn't exist. It's a, it's a political slogan. And uh, it's either used by governments to say, look at what we're doing, it's super evidence-based, therefore good. Or it's used by critics of governments to say, this is bad because this, you've not used evidence. And I, th and I think, as a slogan, that's all it does. Uh, and that's why you know, people get into evidence-informed. And, uh, that's, it's a bit like, evidence-informed is a bit like, um, what do you call it? Um, Homeopathy, you know, you know that's medicine reform, you know, that, you know, kind of thing. You know. Um, uh, it doesn't, you know, actually the phrases don't really help you. So I think if it doesn't, I think what really that means is, you know, what happens when I have some great evidence and I'm not having much of an impact with it, then you deal with it by making choices about how strategic you want to be. That. So, um, on the, me being simplistic, I'll try not to state that too personally. The um, uh, I, I think that's true. I think I think I, I, I was trying to sort of give you the sense that you know that was a quite a lot longer fifty minute story of fifty years of work, and you know it really does simplify to the point of something. I don't know, but uh, but actually, if you go into that work, they do. They, I think that applies most to highly salient, highly contentious issues where people are in the business of demonizing their opponents, like uh, in fracking, where the, the big messages are, these companies are you know, killing the planet and they're only out for it for themselves and they're the villains of the peace. We're the heroes who are going to stop them. And I think that is the kind of, however, that's not, not a nuanced discussion that you'll find in you know, a thousand page reports. But it is the type of language that people will be using when they're competing with each other. So often the choice is to give people a lot of information knowing that this is how they're going to use it. They're going to, they're going to simplify. You know? so, um, but there are case studies that they talk about which are much more nuanced and their role for scientists is much more as brokers between positions where, where people aren't so attached to their beliefs to the extent that they are engaged in some form of co cooperation 
and therefore researchers have some, have some kind of authority to adjudicate, you know, with, with, with claims and so. Uh, so in terms of the, the expanding, so I mean, this is this is where my bias comes out. I think so. When I was an undergraduate. Or oh, such a long time ago, but um, I was—I had no interest at all in elections and protest. I just—I don't know what it was. I just didn't find the exciting very exciting. And I was much more interested in this work on policy communities. And I think that's reflected in the sort of things I talk about. Yeah. Now I think my offering to you in that case is that the appearance of excite is exciting the right word. Exciting, politics, worrying, anxiety-inducing politics is a handy hook for me, because I come along and say, okay, we're so used to paying attention to the most high profile uh, issues that most people are engaged in. And I say the logical consequence of that is if, <coughs> if, if most people focus their attention on a tiny proportion of the world or government business, almost everyone is paying no attention to almost all government business. And that's what this explains, which is most policy takes place in policy communities. Most ideas are not challenged on a routine basis. They become paradigms because for long periods no one's really doing anything. Uh, no one's really involved. Institutions are standard operating procedures because you know these, these things, people still have to do things even though no one pays attention. You know, so that's, that's the kind of offer I get. So I accept, what I, sh I suppose what I should say is, 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 unless you don't have that hook, this makes less sense. Right, okay, so I have two mental votes, right, so power, Start with power, and I'll start with, oh, you're so used to the exciting world of politics. I used to do this, and, and I, I used to come along and say, you're so used to politics being really exciting, I'm going to give you 50 minutes on how enormously dull it is. And actually, I, 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 as I recount that, that's why I stopped doing it. Uh, it's just not in the right mood. <laughs> but that's my punchline at the end. You know, this, you know uh, a small proportion of the, of the policy process is is profoundly important, uh, high salience, but most government business is humdrum. And I think that's where uh, there's a lot of value to be had in being powerful with evidence. You know, give it to someone who's particularly interested with no one else being interested. Okay, uh, we've got time for some more. So, any more questions? We've got one there. Oh, well, yeah. so that's great. So, so, yeah. um, I'm here from the Royal College of Art. Um, I actually work on ethical sourcing of materials. Um, that's why I'm here. Um, I'm particularly interested, especially because the metaphor that you love the most mm. was getting a few hundred thousand tonnes of fuel together and setting light to it with somebody <laughs> on top. Why you don't see the material world appearing in these theoretical diagrams, mm. in any sense, and what does that mean for when these actually go out into the real world, how they might collapse or suffer problems? Oh, because it's, 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 it's too abstract? Well, uh, it's, all of this is either about social interaction yeah. or about abstract ideas. Okay. There's no material elements affecting this in any way. There's no... Okay, um, I suppose, it, oh, I'm going to try not to be too defensive, but if I, <laughs> if I were defensive, I would say the material world is essentially in, in context and events. And I realize that's such a big other category, but essentially, you know, the material, you know, so when I describe very briefly events, uh, unanticipated events are, um, uh, you know, high profile natural disasters prompted by climate change. Um, major oil spills that prompt attention to fossil fuels. Um, uh, you know, levels of social behaviour that people take into account when they're trying to control social behaviour. So it, it's it's in there. It's just I suppose if uh, you know, combining what you were saying, I suppose what I could do is I could uh, is that hang is that what I, do? You know, I would do that and I would expand context and events and in there would be uh, the social world and the and the physical world. Yeah. Uh, I suppose if we're being, if we're, if we're jumping on the, being critical of this, you would say, okay, they, they also seem, you know, they're all too separate from each other. You know, when actually in, in the real world everything connects. But I suppose the the main, uh, I'm pointing, you can't see that. Uh, the main, uh, the main context for me is that 
normally when you start these kind of things, people put up the policy sign, and, it's, and, and that's simple. And I say, okay, if you want simple, you know, go for this one that is deceptively simple. That, that's my, um, my aim. I'm actually, I, I'm being honest, I got a bit excited when you said where you're from, because what I want to do is work on this some more. Uh, but all, but the opposite way you were talking about, it, which is I am looking for the most memorable <coughs> image based on its simplicity. So that, so so if I put it up and took it off, people could remember and tell me what it was about, and then we could have a discussion about what all those things meant. And I think the problem with the other one is I think all you remember from that is it's a big mess. Okay, <laughs> and I want you to remember more, you know, about the, these concepts. Okay, so I guess they're trade offs. Jackie? Yeah, I was interested really, this kind of goes back to the discussion about power, I suppose, mm. because I'm, a, I'm my name's Jackie Shaw and I'm in the participation cluster mm. at IDS, and um, we do a lot of research with the most marginalised communities, mm. so people who have very little power, and I particularly use visual methods and participatory video both as a way of doing ground level research, but mm. also supporting people in uh, making influencing narratives for different audiences. And I'm also a social psychologist, so that comes with the knowledge that majority influence and minority influence is very different from a power perspective. And we found that, you know, if you... It, we do a lot of the things you're talking about in mm. terms of helping people build stories that engage people, make emotional attack, uh, connection with on a people-to-people -people basis and yeah. suggest what policymakers can do. So kind of reframing stories so they appeal to people's beliefs. Mm. That's fine with majority influence, whereas if you can frame something that brings people along with you, but I think minority influence works in very different ways. It's much mm. more disruptive. It speaks to unruly politics and so on and so forth. You need to, you know, what are the tipping points that create social movements and so on. Yeah. And we've found a real tension between supporting people to... Um, contest power, I suppose, bring uh, views from stigmatised communities into mm. policy-making space, trying to make emotional connection, but actually sometimes the emotions are anger because people don't like being contested and yeah. don't go along with you. Mm. And that's very different from we found that actually if you can engage people, build alliances by getting them excited about something new that's happening, then they'll come along with you. But then there's a danger that you legitimise something you don't want to. So I don't know whether you've thought at all in your work about the balance between the different ways majority and minority influence work in that way. Yeah, so um, I suppose if I'm just... What I'd like to say is pretend that I'm not me anymore, so then I can be say, oh, look, look at this guy's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, what was he thinking? Uh, so, I mean, a good example would be this one. Essentially, you know, there is um, engage with citizens and stakeholders is in there. But of course, this is from a European Commission perspective, and and so they're not going to, as far as I know, their their business is not to in, encourage citizens to really challenge what they're doing. It's to, well, you know, in some cases, it's to smooth what they're doing. It's to generate ownership for what they want. I mean, not, not them in particular. I mean, this is kind of government business. You consult to, to smooth and, and generate acceptance. Uh, so, of course, you know, if in that context, there's a value judgment you've already made when you engage with that kind of process, which is, you know, uh, government is good and things are, you know, we're not in the fundamental change business. Okay, and, yeah, so it would... Uh, and I'm guessing when I... So often my audience are... Scientists and academics, and, you know, they're they're more, they're wanting to know how to make an impact to satisfy their funding bodies. You know, they're not they're not interested in you know changing the world, and that's why connecting with that idea that most academics are real kind of big lefty anti-establishment. In my experience, they're you know, I don't know I deal with on the basis. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, so. There is some work of which I'm aware that we could talk about, which is more, um, let's say the Open, open Society Foundations mm -hmm. are much more about um, encouraging storytelling at a community level to enthuse much bigger populations to start telling stories from their perspective. Uh, 
uh, policy change. And I suppose I didn't mention that really because it's not, it's not, that's not me. I can't talk with authority on that, but I know who, people who, who can. Um, and they run storytelling uh, workshops. Actually, after this, I'm going for storytelling coaching. Uh, you know, imagine that. This really surprises me. I don't know, because I can really suck the edge out of a room. So you imagine me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there's a, I think there's a lot of it about uh, in lots of different contexts. I suppose I'm talking about the more conservative stuff, yeah, which usually goes down a tree with conservative <laughs> audiences, you know. Okay, but I accept their other opinions exist. Okay, so we had another question, I think. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think mine was actually um, quite related to the last one. Um, I, I kind of really appreciated the way that you, um, you know, said that, you know, for certain types of perhaps specific policy changes, mm. sharing information with the allies who already agree with you and getting them to act is quite an effective um, strategy. But I'm not sure whether I completely understood how, on that last level of your ladder, you would humor these people who have all of these negative stereotypes and cherry-pick evidence in order to, I don't know, promote your own agenda, but still leaving their kind of worldview intact. I'm not sure if, I, if, if you could maybe give an example yeah. of how that might work. Because to me, that seems like you're almost telling us to give up on changing people's minds, really, or, or changing their deeply held beliefs. And a lot of that work um, that, that, you know, we do at IDS with very marginalized communities mm. um, who are facing the brunt of that, you know, those stereotypes and punishment and exclusion is about humanizing them and, and changing the, the um, yeah, changing the views and prejudices of the majority of the population. So I, I just... That tension between do you just go with people who already agree with you or try and humor people's views or or yeah. are we really kind of leaving aside trying to change people's beliefs or ideas about the world? Yeah. So I mean I guess the stuff uh, I know most about are more kind of UK domestic, so they're not um, international development. But um, I suppose those kind of cases would be uh, favourite's not the right word, but one of my things that I've published on was um, uh, UK families policies. Now a lot of that is based on a, the UK government identifying what started off as 118,000 problem families in England and turning their lives around. And um, I think the most influential evidence through that process was evaluations of family intervention projects which showed some kind of demonstrable evidence that if you introduced them they would make a difference. That's the kind of evidence that, that they were paying attention to, the stuff that would support what they were doing. Uh, there were also at the same time there's a lot of critical scholarship that essentially says, you know, this is a highly, you know, the only word I can think is evil, uh, what's, what's the kind of more polite? Word for evil government. Um, sinister. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but you know, wrong, wrong government who are doing fundamentally the wrong thing with characterising families. And I, and I suppose what I was saying is, you know, they they had an important part to play, but it was not to influence the government of the day. It was to inform the ideas, hopefully, of the next government with the chance to change what they were doing. And even then, you know, if you look at that, the, the problem family government was the Labour government replaced by the super problem family Conservatives. You know, so if you're an academic in that field, I think you would know that you could you could challenge that government from afar and be an outsider and accept a role, you know, and go down, you know, protest and you know, so you, the protest role, or to be an insider, you have to go along with with a kind of respect agenda or something like that. And, I suppose if you're trying to be super clever, you can try and work with people's beliefs and, and try and change uh, how they try and support them. So, um, well, I don't know, well, it's hard to explain some things in detail, but um, if, if someone's beliefs are quite ill-formed and they're quite vague, they're problem families in respect, they're, they're not well thought out ideas, then there's a lot of space within them to say, okay, with this evidence, these programs, we have satisfied your objectives. 
I think a lot of people are in the business of uh, harm reduction, harm, yeah, policy harm reduction. Go along with government, <coughs> presenting evidence that, that sort of supports it, but, but goes against it, and in, in the implementation, you know, kind of challenges some of the tenets. Okay, so we've got uh, a couple more minutes, so, uh, yep, on here. Uh, perhaps give me a sense of how many more questions are coming, so I know, have you got a few more people? Put your hands up, you, you're planning to ask a question in the next five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Only one, okay, you can make it as long as two. <laughs> right, okay, ask next. Um, thanks, my name's Katie Tobin, I work for Watergate Advocacy. And so I'm wondering, within your ladder of sort of how far you'll go, hmm. you haven't really told us what you think works the best. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, could you give us some guidance on sort of if, if, if the ultimate aim is to affect policy, what among those do you think mm. is the sort of best strategy? Well, I, I, I'm just going to sound like such a cop-out, but I think part of the reason I don't do that is because um, I, so I, I'm already doing this in my mind. You, there is no best, uh, because to define the best outcome is to define what you want, and that's not the same for everyone. Um, so, plus, I, I don't think this stuff I refer to really gives you much strong evidence on, because imagine, imagine you were investigating these two choices. Uh, for example, you do a randomized controlled trial of two different groups. One is super sincere and objective, and the other is super devious and that sort of thing. And um, I, 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 I don't know how to get through the ethics side of it, uh, but you can imagine, it, it just it wouldn't, I, don't, I haven't seen a study like it. And so what we're doing is we're piecing together things with counterfactuals and that sort of thing. And, and people are, I mean, what I would say to people is what they're going to do is be engaged in, in trial and error over their careers, and they'll be able to work out what, what sort of working in each context. When I see someone, okay, so I did do this paper with someone who's more of a psychology background. He, he talks about, you, you try and work out what drives people. Is it their beliefs? Is it, is it their, do they state an image of objectiveness? And then you first work out that, then you engage on their terms. If they, if they, if they, they seem like they want to be treated as a really intelligent person marshalling all the facts, then you, you present that image. If they're very um, emotional and they've only got a few seconds, you do that. And I think that's, I suppose that's what works, it's to work out what your audience is, how they think, and therefore uh, how you're going to uh, you know, be trusted by them rather than ignored. It's very easy to be ignored very quickly by policy makers, isn't it? So I think that's what's more or worse than that. One at the back. Yeah. Um, my name's Jodie, I'm from the Town People in Brisbane, and we focus on children with disabilities. And um, just like politically in Cambodia, we've got a very challenging times with engaging with politics and local EPOs, and we're trying to network with local organisations, but we are experiencing that the government are really pushing down on us at the moment. Um, but one of our biggest policy problems is um, a sort of overcoming cultural beliefs. Um, and I was just like going back to this to your like original um, figure of psychology of choice. Like, where does culture fit fit into that, um, and how how's that? Some, how do we tackle that? Because like for me, it doesn't really fit under ideas. Uh, well, I suppose for me it does. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I mean, so for me, uh, if I was trying to define culture. It would be a combination of uh, beliefs and practices. So we have often profound beliefs about how the world works and how it should work. And we have practices that reflect that. Uh, and we assign social roles to particular people. And those are often deeply entrenched uh, views of the world that are, we often don't question for long periods. And for me, that's, that's culture. You know, that's practices that are an expression of those beliefs. Um, I mean, uh, so, I mean, if, imagine, well, I suppose if you use history to talk about this, you say, okay, how long did it take to challenge, a, well, okay, mine's a bit more banal, I guess, but um, how, do you, how long did it take to challenge a culture of smoking within a population where at one point, 80% of men smoked everywhere, 
I say this to my students, you know, 20, you know 30 years ago, right? we'd, have, we'd all been popping away and talking about it. How long do you go from that culture towards a completely different one in the UK, which, in which is you, you kind of denormalised? And you probably say, well, that took 50 years, something like that. And, and I would say to people, well, that's not bad. You know, for such a huge cultural shift, that, you know, that's, that's, that's good go, and you, you'll struggle to emulate that in, in most other cases. So I think that's, that's what we're facing, isn't it? It's about what you do in the 50 years when you know that cultural change is, is, is often, if not generally, a hugely long-term process, a dispiriting process in which you just don't see it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, that's not quite the... No, it's not good, is it? But uh, you know, it, uh, that's, that, that's what I'd say. Start with that context, uh, set your expectations based on that, and then um, there, are th there are things to do. It. So, I mean, I guess, for example, one of the biggest influences on uh, culture is often you know, international influence, for example. And it's, it's about what norm, what's normal. I mean, culture is about what's normal, isn't it? So often if a country or its policymakers become embarrassed, but their practices are out of step with the international norm, and that, you know, that, that, that makes a difference. Uh, but also sometimes that backfires, isn't it? You know, you, 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 so, you know, I'm going to have a bit now. You know, it, it's, I mean, I suppose I would say to myself, what difference can I make? Well, if I spend 50 years on it, maybe I'll contribute to cultural change over that period, and, and that, that's okay. <coughs> okay, we're almost out of time, so I'm just going to... Um Thank you everyone for their questions and a couple of final thoughts. I mean, I think one of the purposes of bringing Paul here was because, um, you know, we talk a lot at IDS about challenging, you know, being radical and challenging dominant paradigms, but, you know, we have our own. Um, and, I, and it's good sometimes to be challenged and, and what we've done, in fact, is challenge Paul. On, but, but, you know, I think it's, it's, good, it's a good reminder that there's other different ways of looking at the world and different ways of thinking about how evidence interacts with policy. Um, so, you know, whereas, whereas our, I think our core values and ideology here drives an interest in uh, you know, minority influence and participation and research as a process, research as development, rather research as something which produces evidence that then can support somebody's argument, that's a great position to be in and it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful ideology and it's, it's, it's also, I think, a moral position. But what Paul, I think, has reminded us is none of us are honest brokers. Okay, we all are in some way generating evidence and using evidence that, and working with others that share some of those values and those ideas with us. And I think the challenge he's given us is, does that limit to some extent? Is that a choice that if you make, it limits how influential you can be uh, as a change maker in more formal political structures? Um, and I think the other, the other thing, um, I like is that it's, it's made us think about, you know, whether, and the one, my one challenge, I suppose, is can, it, it, the best thing surely is to do a bit of both. And so, in, you know, my experience, you know, it is possible, and I think IDS does some of this, that you can in, in, in simultaneously operate on the inside and the outside. But that, that does require really understanding what's going on. And, and, and perhaps that's the answer. It's not to have to make that hard choice between colluding with a political system that favours elites, uh, or working with communities to empower them, but perhaps perhaps we can do both. Mm. Um, so I just want to mention our next event, and then we can have a big round of applause for Paul. Uh, we have uh, we're coming again. Uh, uh, there'll be another event here at IDS on the twenty first of March. Um, Evidence into policy and practice series, uh, but this time focused on how can social network analysis. Uh, be used to help explain how research and evidence is constructed and used. And we've got uh, speakers both from IDS and from outside. Louise Clark from the, from the Knowledge, Impact and Policy team is going to be talking about how the Impact Initiative has been using social network analysis to understand relationships within knowledge, specialist knowledge communities. We've got Catherine Oliver coming from the London School of uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, who's used social network analysis to look at um, how evidence is used in public health. Um, and we've got Jordan uh, Chilingirian from Bath University who's used social network analysis to look at think tanks and how think tanks internationally construct knowledge. So I hope you can join us on the 21st. Uh, you can sign up uh, on the IDS website. We can have a big round of applause for Paul.